Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Absolute History Podcast, an audio platform to examine pre-modern Islamic, Islamic history and the global medieval past. In the final part of a 12-part series entitled A Spring of Classical Arabic Poetry is Dr. Kevin Blankenship at Brigham Young University in Utah. In this special episode, we conclude our popular series with the unedited recording of a Twitter space held with Dr. Blankenship and listeners on Monday the 27th, December 2021. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. I'm your host, Al Hassan, a PhD student at School of Oriental African Studies, and now on to the show. Yeah. How are you? What time, what time is it where you are? It's, uh, it's 1 p.m., so it's, very, it's a good time for me. You know, it's not too early. Uh, you know, I've, I've had some lunch, feeling energized. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 finish, finish. Oh, I was just going to say it's 8 p.m. for you, right? All right. Um, so what we have here in the UK, uh, so we had Christmas, we've got Boxing Day, which you don't do in the US. Because I remember when I, in my brief right. time in America, the... the, the, the the CEOs is asking me what's Boxing Day, and then but we've also got a bank holiday on the Monday, and very unusually, we have extended bank holiday on the Tuesday as well. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, so it's today and tomorrow are both holidays in the UK. Te- technically, yeah, but m- m- most of the shops are open anyway. Um, oh, okay. I mean, Christmas Day is the only day there's no public transport in the UK. And on New and, yeah. on, and on New Year's Day, but in the in the evening, there's trains running on, so people can go to the, to the city centre and come back. Mm, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's similar to here. You know, um, <clears throat> Christmas obviously was a um, was on Saturday, but um, I don't know. I, I think a lot of things stay open. You know, traditionally, I think more things closed, but. Um, a lot of businesses recognize that if they stay open, they can do more business, obviously. So, um, I don't know, it's kind of a, it depends on where you live, too. Um, so, like, in a big city, I think more places stay open, but um, in, a, in smaller cities and towns, especially if there's a, a higher percentage of uh, Christians, then um, you might find more things closed. So, like, where I live, there's, you know, an abundance of of Mormons, so um, you know things just like from the local culture tends to shut down more. Do Mormons celebrate Christmas? I'm sorry to sound ignorant. Oh yeah. Okay. I don't know if you knew that. I'm more. I'm Mormon. Uh, Talha. I don't know if you knew no, that. No, no, no. I, I, I figured. You know how I, 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 because I, I was thinking. Well, he teaches at Utah. Okay. He teaches at Brigham <laughs> Young University. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and then <laughs> you know what gave it away. I was watching this thing on. Net- oh, by the way, hi Tash, thank you for joining us. We're just going to wait for more people to come. I was watching this um, documentary on um, on Netflix about that about that high uh, Salman, hi Abdullah. We're just going to wait for more people to join us. So sure. <clears throat> um, I was I was and if if any, if any of you guys um, want to join in, just send me the request, um, and I will try to get you to speak. Um, so yeah, I was watching this documentary on Netflix um, about that that the, the ex Mormon guy who did the forgeries. Oh yeah, uh huh, yeah yeah. Oh, oh hi, Doctor Silver. It's good to good to see you here. Um, we're going to wait for some more people before we begin. And so there was a dude there that was interviewing, uh, and he wore this bow tie, and he's very distinctive, <laughs> right? I thought, bloody hell, that's the bow tie you have in, in the photo you have right there. Then, and then I thought, well, I don't know if that was a Mormon thing or just like a like a <laughs> local it's thing. Of, but it's it's part like... of our uniform. Like a, it's like a kippa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mormons have to wear it. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah, the, the forger, was it Mark Hoffman? Was I that the, the gentleman? I can't remember, but um, it was an extraordinary mm-hmm. story. But it was a bow tie. Cause I did, oh, hi, Sophia. Um, so I, I wanted to, um, I didn't feel it was polite to ask directly, but, um, 
But um, yeah, but now now we know, so everyone else here knows, I guess. <laughs> That's right. No, it's it's you know you can you you can deduce it. I mean, if you know anything about Brigham Young as a school, um, you know it's odds are that you know fa- any given faculty member you know is a practicing Mormon. So. Cause I, I, I saw um, I, I saw I, I saw a documentary about Brigham Young University. I think it's a promo. I think it might be a Brigham Young production themselves. But it was about non Mormon <laughs> students there, and um, yeah, but yeah. It, it, it it got me thinking. Like so, so when like these like very like chase students go on dates, do they the clay don't go out for coffee then? Yeah, so um, you're asking if people go on dates or like what what the date consists of when they go on a date. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, you know, people will go out, and it's funny. I'll say, you know, to colleagues, you know, let's go get coffee, and then you know, the day of when we actually go, I'll just get something else or whatever. But you know, because going for coffee means more. It just means like let's you know get together and you know share food or a drink or something and chat. Um, but yeah, like going on a uh, date, are you, are you, were you asking if people, if, if there's like kind of inter-religious dating at BYU? I just wanted to know, like, if they're not having coffee, what they're drinking then? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, pretty much any anything else. Um, you know, uh, Mormons in Utah especially, we love, and I, and I fall into this category as well, we love uh, diet soda. Okay. Uh, you know, so Coke or, um, you know, Mountain Dew or these things, uh, it's interesting, you know, cause that technically not, like not doesn't go against the sort of, um, injunction against certain foods and drinks, but, um, you know, people, uh, people enjoy that. They'll enjoy, um, you know, just whatever else you can think of water, juice, milk, you know, there was a phase where I wanted to try and avoid caffeine. And so, hi, BB, hi, Hamad, thank you for joining us. We're just going to wait for some more people before we get started. So uh, there, was a, there was a phase when I wanted to avoid caffeine, and I thought, you know what, let me just see what these Mormons do, right? And so, like, there's like all these, like, really amazing sort of caffeine alternatives, but I don't think any of them are available in the UK. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's true. I mean, in, in Utah, especially just, again, because of the prevalence of Mormons, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of those kinds of things. You know, I, I imagine it's like, for such, especially for someone who was raised in the religion, you know, I, uh, I don't, um, you know, you find kind of, I guess, workarounds that by this point, you know, I'm, you know, I'm almost 40 and I, I haven't, I don't miss, you know, um, the things that I, I wasn't raised with, I guess, or that I didn't discover in college. And, uh, you know, so, um, you know, where another person might drink coffee in the morning to wake up. Like I like to get up early and go to the gym and, uh, you know, get in a workout and that has a way of waking me up, you know, showering early or things like, you know, other things like that. I mean, I still drink plenty of <laughs> caffeine in the form of soda, but for someone who doesn't, it's, uh, you know, there's other ways that you can sort of get the same get the same effect, I guess. So, so I'm curious. So, so what does the pious um, Mormon drink first thing in the morning if they're not drinking coffee? What what has the same effect? Oh, I mean, you'll find you'll find all, oh the same effect. Um, yeah, you know, you'll find you'll find all kinds of um, preferences, I guess. You know, sugar, I imagine, serves the same purpose. Kind of spikes your you know energy level. Uh, something like that, um, or even eating, you know, in the morning, um, just kind of you get some sugar in your bloodstream has the same effect, I guess. If anyone um, wants to uh, speak, just send a, um, a request, and um, we're happy for, to, to, to hear you. We're just waiting. For yeah, we're just having a casual conversation we're right just, now. We haven't having, really started with an official. We're having what they call small talk until more people. That's right. Um, That's right. What we might do. Because we've got some very serious people here, because um, because because quality is greater than quantity, is it not? So That's right. uh, we'll we'll wait two minutes and then um, uh, we'll begin. I mean, I I, I I what I wanted to do is um, I wanted to sort of go over everything we we covered and just get your personal kind of. Um, uh, reflections on them and also may- maybe like on hindsight you felt you missed out some stuff and you wish you had mentioned it um <clears throat> so we can d- do that and then um i mean there's a number of i know i know 
I know Laurie personally uh, and Sophia um, and so <clears throat> I know I know there's, there's people who are always interested in um, learning Arabic and last time we had our Twitter space we were talking about the sort of um, the learning of Arabic and um, yeah that's right it was good because um, Muhammad uh, what's his name oh god what's that dude's name he teaches at Westminster yeah yeah oh, I um Oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the Algerian dude. So he he um, so it, it was interesting to sort of hear about um, uh, sort of the, the pedagogy of, of of teaching Arabic in sort of in the Anglosphere, um, and then also sort of the need for looking at um, Arabic literature as well. Yeah, that's that's always an interesting conversation. I teach at a school. We tend to focus on modern standard Arabic and uh, dialect because the purpose, you know, most of the students that um, undergraduates that study Arabic, where I teach anyway, they they want to learn it so that they can work in, um, you know, uh, government or nonprofits or business or something where you know you wouldn't need to know the niceties of of grammar or meter or things like that. Um, so it's always interesting to hear people who like they, you know, they're undergraduates, you know, t- take Arabic more like, as it were, a classical language where you learn it primarily to read it um, and then access text in it. There's, it's in some ways the field is still kind of bifurcated this way where you have people, again, who focus more on the language as it's, as it's a lived language today. Uh, and so you can operate sort of an everyday speaking uh, and writing context and accessing media and versus people who study, you know, to put it sort of broadly, history of Islam, Islamic civilization, literature, thought, these kinds of things, which again, primarily you study. So it's interesting that those two things haven't integrated yet for all the effort, you know, over the last 30 years to put out books like Al-Kitab and, you know, curriculum, other curriculum reforms, things like that. It's still, uh, um, I guess, speaks to the, people's needs like why they need arabic what they're using it for anyway what so what, what's the arabic department like at brigham young like what, what was the size and numbers and what is this part of like a, hi hussam thank you for joining us is, is it like um part of a bigger like nary's faculty how, how does it work there yeah so uh so we're kind of going through a transition phase right now all the people who um, you know, they got hired in the eighties and nineties, they're all retiring right now. So, you know, the younger fact of the younger faculty, there's me and one other gentleman named Spencer Scoville. And we're both, um, you know, got our PhDs in literature of all things, as opposed to like sociolinguistics or second language pedagogy or something like that. Um, you know, or, or you know, uh, FIP or something else. But, um, yeah, so we have, um, you know, up until recently had five faculty members, each specializing in some different aspect of Arabic language, literature, culture, Islam, something like that. And uh, we have quite a large program. Actually, we put out more Arabic language majors than any other, as undergraduate majors than any other school in America. We put out about, you know, between 40 and 50 a year. And um, this is historically speaking. And, you know, we also put them out at a fairly high level of proficiency. So if you look at the, there's a, you know, a, a, a body of, um, you know, a professional body for people who teach language in America. It's ACTFL. So it's the American Council for Teachers of Foreign Language. And they have a rating system whereby, you know, if you're trained in it, you can sit down with someone and ask them some questions and then based on how, how they respond, sort of place them on the scale in terms of their proficiency. Anyway, we, we have we tend to put out undergraduates who have a high level of proficiency in Arabic for someone who's only, you know, done a couple of years of it in college. Um, so all, all that's to say is it's, historically it's a strong program and I, I myself am a product of that program, not to say that I'm, I'm any good at what I do, but just that like I, I had a good experience with it and I was glad to, to come to a place where where they have such a strong program. But anyway, um, in terms of numbers of students, it's, it's quite large. You know, at any given year, we have between 150 to 200 students taking first-year Arabic, like the first semester of first-year Arabic. Right. Um, and every fall semester, we have a study abroad program to typically to, to Jordan and Amman. And we'll take, you know, a group of between 35 and 45 students. And this is, again, every year um, uh, in the fall, we take a group that large, so... Um, you know, it's, 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 
it benefits from some historical inertia, having this program that's been strong for a long time, dedicated faculty, students who are, who are you know, um, typically don't grow up learning Arabic or, or having Middle East heritage in their families, but who are really hungry for, for knowledge of the region and its people. So all these things could have contributed to a strong program. And so obviously the British system and the American systems are are different. Um, so at SOAS, well, the, the, the way, hi Michelle, hi everyone else has joined us. So the, the, at SOAS, it might, might have changed more recently, but it's a, it's a four year, the undergraduate is a four year degree. Um, normally degrees in the UK are three years. Um, so you've got the first year, second year. Um, and, and they use this really archaic, awful textbook by Owen Wright. You know it. What's what? Which textbook? It's by Owen Wright. Owen Wright. Is it the Orange Book series? <clears throat> well, I used to call it the Green Book because it was green, and uh, right. and it was. It's really um. It's really sort of linguistic heavy and technical, and. Um, <clears throat> awful and you know t- typical thing of you know start with political vocab and all that kind of stuff right and it, it over complicates the language i found right and it has its own sort of idiosyncratic ways of um making sense of the language right um i see i see professor wright is emeritus faculty at soas um that's interesting I, i'm assuming you haven't taken classes with him no so, so i think that's the son I think this is this is the, the I think I, I if I so there's a guy there who who's like um, an expert in Arabic musicology. Yeah, that's him. This is the gentleman. I'm, I'm at least from his publications. I'm seeing you know but music theory in the staff of the age. This is 2019. I don't um, I don't think that's the same. I think the guy who wrote the book. I don't know if it's the same guy. I don't know if it's Owen. Right. Anyway, so you have got this awful textbook, and. Um, <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> and then in the third year, they send you abroad. So in the past, it was either Alexandria or um, Damascus. So clearly Damascus is like no longer an option. So it's Ale- yeah. then it was Alexandria and Nablus. And now that's, I don't think, a thing. So it's Alexandria and somewhere in Jordan. Okay. Yeah. And then in the fourth year, you come back and you might learn... It's like there was, at that time there was an option to do a, like an introduction to to nudge the dialect. Um, there's, there's a couple of options in um, introduction modern Arabic literature that was done by uh, Dr. Yang, and there was an introduction to classical. Sorry, the, the classical one was done by Dr. Yang. Introduction to classical, Arabic. and then you've got sort of like adjacent stuff like the Islamic studies stuff that people might want to do. So you've got you've got Every year you get four courses, and they and then they've got. A, I don't know if they've got it anymore. So if, if anyone from SOAS here can correct me, they used to have a thing in the past called a floater, and that was like an optional language um, thing, which wasn't which wasn't accredited. And so, like if you did economics, they would encourage you to take advantage of of, of learning an extra language. So you've got the four All units. Right. You've got four units every year. So in the first year, if you're doing straight Arabic three of the units is arabic one and then you pick something else and then the second year i think it's like two two and then in the third year you go abroad and you're supposed to write like a something like a five thousand word essay in in arabic which i don't which, that, which i don't think it stretches people enough at all right and then in the fourth yeah. and then in the fourth year you come back and there's like one unit of arabic four and then there's like uh, which is like more like introduction of classical arabic grammar and then there's, yeah. um, then you could do like, you know, other odds and ends, other courses, like I said to you. But the thing is, right, I think you can teach someone Arabic quite efficiently in one year, full time. Uh, I just think they faff around stretching it over four years like this. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I think it'd be, I, I say it's difficult to, um, you know, the, first, what, the way it's structured at Brigham Young is we have two years uh, on campus of Arabic, first, second semester, third, fourth semester. And then uh, you would have a yearly study abroad. You know, so third year, we sort of cram that into that study abroad experience, or that's the idea anyway. And then, um, 
and then they come back and they have you know uh, sort of advanced Arabic classes, which are just, uh, a lot of that is to sort of fill in gaps. Typically, the students will go to Jordan and they'll develop high level proficiency in speaking Jordanian dialect, but they don't spend a lot of time and they spend time reading, but they don't spend as much time. Uh, either writing in 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 standard Arabic, modern standard Arabic, or speaking in modern standard Arabic, so producing modern standard Arabic generally. So you know, several of these classes that we have for sort of advanced Arabic post study abroad are geared for using fusha, using modern standard Arabic, the way an educated native speaker would. If you you know you were writing a paper in Arabic, or if you were giving a you know a talk or a speech or something like that. Um, and so it, it's it's a very it's quite a balanced program, and the one thing that you know I'd like to see more of is like dipping into classical Arabic. But I understand why we don't historically do as much as that kind of stuff because there's less of a market for it, plain and simple. And um, you know you can you, that might sound crass to you know sort of look and see what you know students are looking at in terms of the job market and, and what job opportunities are there. Or you can look at it as you're doing your students a favor by giving them skills that they can actually use in the real world. Just because, I mean, we all love classical Arabic or, you know, those of us who have been lucky enough to study it and to use it. Um, but, you know, unless you're planning to, I don't know, <laughs> unless you're unless you're planning to train as an imam, uh, or uh, do something else where you only need to read Arabic. You know, you might as well learn statistics or something if you can't actually use Arabic in a way that can, you know, uh, that it, it's a good tool for you out there in the world. Anyway, but I don't get that because if if the grammar's the same, then I don't see how you can differentiate between classical and modern. And also because heritage is so strong. Yeah, in a way that it doesn't exist for it for 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 English. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand the, what what different differentiation there is there. On the point of grammar, it's a, it's a good question. On the point of grammar, um, you know, uh, knowing grammar doesn't mean that you can produce the language, and this is borne out by studies of native speakers. You know, you ask the average native speaker of any language to like parse a sentence; mm. they can't do it. Mm. Um, just because that's not how native speakers learn their language. They learn it just by, you know, you're bombarded every day with Arabic or Spanish or whatever it is that you, you grow up around. And then, you know, if you take Noam Chomsky's view of grammar, there's something in your brain that, like, you know, is naturally attuned to being able to uh, tease out uh, or, you know, recognize patterns and tease out rules and things like that. And, you know, then you go to school to kind of fill in the gaps of that process. But, you know, you, you don't you don't come into the world and then you know on on in week two of your life in this world you know start parsing <laughs> sentences. Um, so even though you're absolutely right, even though you know the the, the a lot of the I mean you know it's in ninety five percent of the grammar is the same. There are some differences you know because of uh, you know influences from Western languages and also as a language um, becomes more. You know, if the emphasis is more on speaking, then it tends to be more syntax bound, which is why, you know, you can have, if you, you know, can read Latin, um, you know, a lot of Latin texts, like the word order is all over the place because you have declension and you can tell what the word is doing in a sentence just by looking at the word. But in, you know, a lot of modern languages, it's much more, the syntax is much stricter because it's a, you know, more of a spoken language. Anyway, all that's to say that um, just be, just knowing the grammar doesn't mean that you can you can produce the language, you can speak it or write it. And then as for you had another good another good point that you brought up to Talha, which I can't remember. <laughs> can, you, can you remind me if you no, remember about, the it's other? About, it's, about, it's about the idea of heritage. So I don't understand how you uh, can teach Arabic without like with like in the without an introduction to to classical. Uh, poetry because it's all part and parcel in a way of of, of the contemporary doing or amongst yeah, I, mean, I agree I agree with that and that's that's one thing you know I, I see myself in this role is trying to insert a little bit more of that in our program um you know uh I guess again it depends on sort of what you want to use the uh the language for you don't need a whole class in classical arabic poetry to get like a smattering of references that you might see in a newspaper article for example mm -hmm. to know that you know there's this trope of you know al buka al atlaq crying over uh, or weeping over you know the ruined campsite of a beloved 
and just knowing that that's there. You don't have to read all of the ma'alakat or things to know that that's there. And so when you see it in a news article or say something, again, we're using modern standard Arabic to know that, oh, there happens to be this thing. Again, I would, I would love to see more of that. But, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get someone graduated from a program in four years or less uh, with a certain amount of training, um, you know, and, and you assume that 98% of the students that you're teaching are not going to go on to grad school so that they can be classicists in Arabic, then, you know, one class, maybe two classes and that kind of thing would be sufficient. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's all, uh, we're, you constantly have to tweak it, I guess. And this is, again, you know, why I imagine, you know, people might be interested in, so, like, I don't know that I would have enjoyed going to my PhD granting institution, University of Chicago, for an undergraduate degree in Arabic as I did for a graduate degree because I was focused specifically on classical Arabic. It's a great place to study that. And now they've done more to, you know, like, to, to bring modern Arabic both um, sort of standardized Arabic and colloquial into part of the curriculum there. But to a large degree, it's a place where you go if you want to be a classicist. Um, you know, they don't have a focus as far as I know in sociolinguistics. Like if you want to go do ethnographic or ethnolinguistic research out in, you know, a village in Syria or something, look at dialect there. You know, you, 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 you'd be able to get that training someplace else like UT Austin. Um, you know, a, a traditional sort of NELC, Near Eastern Studies or Oriental Studies kind of place would be better if you wanted to, you know, work on the history of Islam. Um, anyway, it, probably, I mean, it might even be, it's probably a good thing overall that we have these different kinds of, I mean, you know, uh, different kinds of departments, kinds of, of focuses. It's like how, uh, you know, hospitals don't all, not every single hospital has a, you know, in America, we call it a trauma one center. I don't know what it would be in, in the UK, but basically, you know, the kind of place where if you have a gunshot wound and the person, you know, will die within a few minutes, if you don't get them to that place, not all hospitals have the kind of resources to deal with that. And what they'll do is they'll share. So there'll be one hospital or two hospitals within like a whole system within a whole area that share that resource. And then those other hospitals that don't have a trauma one center, they'll have these other things. I envision, you know, a network of PhD programs or any kind of, you know, undergraduate master's programs in, in Middle East and Islamic studies kind of the same way. Each one might have a different focus and uh, you sort of lean on each other to cross pollinate. But that's a whole different conversation. I was wondering whether um, at your place they teach how to type in Arabic. Yes. Or, or even how to yes. text. Because for me, that's a massive deficiency that the universe, at least one that at least SOAS doesn't do. Right? SOAS, doesn't, so SOAS doesn't even teach proper handwriting. Even in the fourth year, they, 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 they don't know how to write properly, let alone to uh, type, type and text, which are, are our main inputs for writing in these days. Right. No, I wish I'd, I mean, I have terrible handwriting anyway, but especially in Arabic, I wish I'd gotten <laughs> some tra training in it earlier on. But do, they, do they teach the text, how to text in Arabic and how to type in Arabic? People sort of uh, pick it up. You know, uh, we, we teach how to type in Arabic, but, you know, texting is kind of something people add on if, uh, as, they, as, they, as they start to, you know, develop more friendships with Arabs and, and other people who use Arabic online and, and over text. Um, welcome, Dr. Amal. Thank you for joining us. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, we spent this whole year um, going through a history of um, classical Arabic poetry. Um, we started with um, Imran Qais and then we ended with um, Safi ad Din Al Hilli. So there's 11 people and this is like our, our 12th session. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to pick your favourite out of all of those episodes, which one oh. are you? <laughs> oh, this is tough. This is tough. It's like, you know, which of your children is your favourite? Yeah, well, you know, they're all, they all have wonderful things to, to like about them. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed... You know, several of these. I enjoyed all of them, honestly. But um, you know, there were some where I had to dig in a bit more than I did for others in order to do justice to whoever it was. And that process, you know, taught me more than I otherwise would have known. So the the episode about Halaj, for example, you know, I, I I needed to learn more about sort of the intrigues at court 
that you know led to his eventual uh, trial, conviction, and execution. I didn't know you know half the stuff that I, I learned looking at that. Um, Sophia Dina Al Halli you know is another another figure like this who I uh, you know had some dim sense of you know parts of his uh, of his works, parts of his legacy but um you know I, i definitely learned more from that so those two come to mind in terms of you know taking the opportunity to to learn more and just you know the, the process of putting all these episodes together was a you know for me anyway a great learning experience as much as it it was a you know a chance to um kind of talk to a broader audience about uh, about these names and and their legacies um welcome still reading welcome run the thank you for joining us i think i think I think I, I don't think people appreciate how much work um, you put in to this thing. So, so what we did, we um, we sent the questions out early, and we sort of have like a loose script. I mean, the, the questions are available as tam- timestamps on the on the podcasts. Um, and if you're using a podcast app, you can sort of go straight to the the answers to the questions. But. Um, Yeah, it's a phenomenal amount of prep you had to do because plus because you had to do also the historical background, um, and then tell us tell us about like what it was like to prep for for each one of these episodes. How long how long did like the large one take? Like, what kind of things were you looking at to prepare something like that? Yeah, I mean, I got better at it as I went along. You know, the first couple, I I, I <laughs> sort of. Um, It was like almost like I was doing trying to do original research. I was like, no, I can I can lean on you know secondary research that other people have done um, or translations by other people, and um, you know as long as I give credit where it's due, I think uh, you know felt more comfortable kind of drawing on that material. Didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but um, yeah, I mean it took you know took at least a couple hours for each episode. The way I justified the work, in addition to you know my own learning, uh, and as well as you know contributing to just a great podcast series that you put together Talha uh, you know this for me was class prep eventually I'll I haven't you know taught a you know a full intro to classical Arabic poetry you know in translation at least at BYU but uh, you know taught bits and pieces here and there and this was a great chance for me to put together just the bulk of, of a class like that and even to have my own bit of resource that people can listen to if they need to Yeah, you need to know more about one of these figures or if they want to follow along throughout a class that I can teach. So anyway, being able to justify the, the amount of work that went into it in the time. In addition, it was just, uh, you know, it was fun to, fun to practice being on a podcast. It's helped out since then. Other people have asked me to, you know, be on their podcast or to do, uh, you know, recorded panels or things like that. Getting used to the format, the technology, all that was a good learning experience. I mean, I, I do find people who have been on our podcast, we, I feel like we're like a launching pad for these people to go into greater things. Because you went on that YouTube channel with, what's her name? She has a humongous following. Shannon. Oh, um, uh, Shannon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Shannon Mayer. Or Mayer. Matter. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing we were saying is that um, any time you wanted to have a duvet day and, and sk- skip a day of work, you can just say, oh, refer to episode 35 on Ibn Zaydun. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, and, you know, um, and there's a lot of, uh, there's more information even in an episode that you can typically pack into a lecture, you know, because uh, unless you're just talking the whole time, which I try not to do, you know, try to intersperse lecture with maybe a student has a question or, or if I forget something. So it's like a, I don't want to say a junk drawer, but kind of like an index, you know, a journal of, of my thoughts and um, things that I've learned about these different poets. And what I was thinking of, of, of idea of the future like i was thinking um to look at the individual um and sort of um uh sort of break them down and sort of aim, aim them for like a, a beginner student of arabic literature as well as sort of the the a general listener or con- someone who has general interest in in literature i know you con- you contributed to a um a translation of the, a recent translation of the mu'allaqa tell us about those Yeah, I did. That was that was very. Um, it was unexpected and uh, just a joy to be able to do that. I signed up to do one mualaka of the. You know, there were ten mualakat that we did for that collection. And that was through the. Um, it was a joint effort by a cultural foundation in Saudi Arabia called Ithra, and then a, a Saudi Arabian magazine called El Qafila. 
So um, between those two, um, you know, and there's several key figures involved, they put together this be- turned out beautiful in terms of production, beautiful volume. Um, in which several of us translated and then, you know, collaborating with um, several Arab scholars, primarily from Saudi Arabia, who edited and then commented in Arabic on the, the Mu'allaqat. I ended up doing <laughs> translating four of the Mu'allaqat uh, just because due to, you know, uh, concerns related to COVID uh, and prior obligations, a couple of the translators who had planned to join didn't end up um, being able to follow through. And so, uh, you know, had the, ch- had the chance to contribute more than I, that I first expected. And it was, uh, it was great to spend time with these classical, these, these classics of Arabic literature. And I, um, you know, I learned so much from doing that. And the collaboration was great. I, you know, I, I talked to, there's a major, there's, you know, several major um, publishers, both in the U.S. and in the U.K., who put out translations of sort of classics, you know, from, from whatever tradition. And I talked to an editor at one of these, uh, one of these series, um, and, you know, because I thought, you know, the Ma'alakat, the Hanging Odes, they're so well known. Uh, you know, people have a sense that these things are sort of foundational in terms of Arabic language and culture. Um, and that's only the case in the Middle East, come to find out. It's very difficult, even today, for to, to, if, if, if there's like, unless there's just some, a lot of inertia in terms of a work having been a part of the cultural conversation in the West for a long time, to get people especially for the classics. I'm not talking about modern Arabic literature is a different thing. There's a lot of hunger these days for, you know, especially contemporary Arabic literature coming out right now by living authors. There's a lot more interest in that now, but in terms of the classics, it's still like, you know, the Quran and the thousand and one nights. Mm-hmm. And that's what people know in terms of Arabic. And then, you know, people have heard of Rumi, but of course he wrote in Persian uh, for the most part, you know, he wrote a couple of things in Arabic, but Persian literature is kind of where he fits. So anyway, all that's to say that it's um, still continues to frustrate me that you know again for 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 as important as a text as or you know, a set of texts as the hanging odes are the mu'allaqat that you know they they just haven't gotten their due beyond Middle East civilization and culture. Um, part of my um, you know. I feel part of my, or maybe it's a role that I've taken on for myself, but part of my role, you know, as a scholar and, um, and a teacher is to try and try and get the word out about some of these treasures of classical Arabic literature, you know, especially these foundational things that, you know, otherwise, um, otherwise would continue to be so important in the Middle East, but, uh, but unknown in the West. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with the, the way the word gets out is kind of random at times too. So like, uh, it was either this editor or another editor again at one of these main sort of major press series that put out translations of the classics. This editor was talking about how he had passed over the chance to publish a translation of the Shahnameh, the book, the, the book of Kings, the great Persian national epic. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, he, he didn't say why he passed over, but the reason he was considering it in the first place is that it's mentioned, the Shahnameh is mentioned several times in the novel The Kite Runner, which of course did a lot of business, uh, mm. including being made it, being adapted into a movie. So um, I grew a bit more, you know, through conversations like that, I've grown a bit more, uh, you know, you could say cynical uh, or perhaps realistic in terms of what it takes for something within our fields to gain more traction, to become a part of a cultural conversation. I mean, it really has to make a big splash. And I'm talking like in Hollywood or on TV or, you know, something where lots of people, there's a big market for whatever it is. Um, you know, it's a challenge for us to try and figure out ways to, um, to, to talk to people and get, get that kind of an audience. But I think, um, you know, efforts like yours, Talha, putting together this, uh, this podcast, things like that. That's that's definitely the way to do it. That's the that's the start. Thank you. I mean, it can only be a, a start, but I, I think Imran Qais the movie that, that that would work quite well. I I agree, and there's so especially the Mu'allaqat poets or Tarafa and the Abd, you know, sl, you know, uh, slain 
in his early 20s. Um, you know, there's all this intrigue and murder and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you got the right people behind it, it's just, I don't know, uh, big industries like Hollywood or if you take the big five publishers, um, you know, they, they're just not taking risks. It's, you know, reboots of old movies that did well before. And so now they're, you know, making them again um, or, you know, things like that or or animated films and and superhero movies. You know, that's what seems to bring out a lot of audiences. Those are safe bets. Um, so, you know, in, in addition to finding for uh, forums where we can talk about these things, where more people will listen, it's also a matter of just convincing producers and editors to, uh, you know, to take a chance. I mean, I think I think like the Malakas speak to themes. I mean, good literature always always has a sort of a ring of perennial truth, right? So, so um, yeah. So, like for example, the sort of classical Greek literature still seems very fresh and and relevant. And if you think something like Imran Qais, it's like, um, you know, things that all young men are concerned about: sort of women and yeah. you know, friendship and uh, loneliness and all that kind of stuff, right? And uh, and Antara as well, like especially with like all like sort of contemporary kind of um, anxieties regarding race, right? There's a, there's an insight yeah. there that that can can, yeah. that can help us. Yeah, speaking of of Antara, um, you know uh, the the translation that came out from the Library of Arabic Literature apparently um, the. And then, and then that translation is by um, James Montgomery at Cambridge. That um, apparently began, or you know, the, the the necessary momentum came from a phone call that Phil Kennedy, the the director of Era, Library of Arabic Literature, got from a production company in the Valley in Hollywood, uh, planning to produce a movie about Antara starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. No. Uh, oh which, <laughs> I guess, it, 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 you know, the project withered on the vine. It, yeah, as far as I know, it, uh, it, it, it hasn't been picked up by anyone. But, uh, man, I would, I, I, I'd pay money to see that. But, you know, <laughs> more, more evidence to the point that, you know, you really, and, and it's about market size, you know, like how many eyeballs are you going to get looking at Antara? both on the screen or on the page, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a, it's a calculus that businesses have to do. And I understand that, but um, yeah, isn't that funny? It's a, like the most improbable <laughs> reason for a classical Arabic translation. But you know, you know, like, like we talk about our frustrations, like with these gatekeepers to culture, but, but it's like now we have so many means around that. Right. I mean, they're not perfect, but like, you know, like yeah. you have YouTube and you like you have people who who sort of can get really big on that and so I mean I just think somehow like you just you just find your the audience you want and then you let things sort of grow like a um, as an ink blot right uh, and I, yeah, I, I know, right. like we've been talking about this like like sod working in a university sod like I'm just sorry British university and probably exists for American ones right sod the humiliation of poor pay. So the humiliation of um, poor conditions, right? Because um, we talked about the idea about being like the, the cultural entrepreneurs, right? And yeah. sort of like, you know, like 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 our forebears looking for a patron, trying to find ways of, like clearly that you got like big money who want to avoid paying taxes, right? So they they find yeah. money through you, right? But then also you got like more ones who might. Have, then we still talked about sort of like ex ex gangsters as well who want to sort of redeem their souls by supporting the arts, and then there's just like you know people with money who want a sense of like like posterity or whatever through your you know scholarship or your sort of like you know cultural production. So I just I just think like like we can talk about these frustrations, and I just think there's like ways around that, and not just the the the. the the fora, but also like in terms of funding as well, because there always seems to be a problem with people, like especially like Patreon and stuff like that, as well as yeah. um, you know, um, ex gangsters wanting to redeem their souls. <laughs> yeah, and for this reason, um, you know, uh, a lot of the Gulf monarchies have been just such a boon to our field because you know here's a here's a real interest 
in preserving cultural heritage and in getting it out to new generations of, of young Arabs and Middle Easterners who might not be familiar with all the, the treasures of their own heritage. Um, that's been a huge source of, uh, of support, I know, hey, including for, you know, Library of Arabic Literature and other such ventures. Um, and yeah, I, <laughs> I, um, you know, raises, raises questions about, um, you know, artistic freedom, I guess. Are you, uh, are you always bound to your patron's interests? You know, a lot of people nowadays don't like Mutanabbi's poetry because it sounds like what it was a lot of times, which is propaganda. Um, you know, where's the line between, you know, I, I need this money so that I can produce the projects that I want to produce versus, okay, I'm going to, you know, do this, um, kind of vanity project for my patrons so that I can you know, get the money that I need to do, to do things that really make my heart sing. Um, that's, uh, I think it probably an eternal balance that people are trying to strike, but anyway. Hmm. Um, and then, so after we looked at Ibn Qais, we looked at Al- people who saw, I think, her less known, Al Farazdaq. Um, and we, I don't know what, if there's anything in particular about his life which uh, stood out for you. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's interesting. He, uh, <laughs> Farazdaq, like so many of these poets, beset by um, personal problems uh, and, and also the, just the just their life and times being so turbulent um i mean i, I love the I, i'll call it a friendship between al farazdaq and and jarir uh you know it's it's not the kind of friendship that i'm sure most of us have where you know over over 40 years you know you and your we'll call it a frenemy uh not 40 years but you know series, series of decades exchange these just awful barbs with each other, you know, um, insulting each other's families, each other's tribes, each other's, you know, physical appearance and all this kind of stuff. Um, but, um, I think also there's such a mutual respect there for each other as artisans. You know, this is, I mean, it's such a, such a cliche to compare classical Arabic poetry to rap, but, um, this is one aspect I think of rap culture that, um, it seems very harsh, outside of the context but if you watch kind of like a, a rap battle between two people you know it's i don't i don't think that in most cases your rappers like rap is sort of an adversarial uh field just like law and you know even though you're sort of going at each other you have to work together assuming that you're going to stay in that field uh and and there's sort of this mutual respect that emerges from like oh he got in a good one on me or something like that um so I, that's kind of how I envision this friendship or, you know, frenemyship, whatever you want to call it, between these, these two figures. But yeah, that, that, that about Farazda and just, you know, his problems with in love and, uh, you know, changing political fortunes, I guess. Um, th- these are all things that sort of struck me as I was, uh, as I was putting, putting that episode together. Yeah, Farazda and Jarir, both of them deserve more, uh, deserve more attention. I mean, again, the Umay- Umayyad poetry in particular kind of falls together with classical, uh, sorry, pre-Islamic classical Arabic poetry mm. in terms of, you know, the, the style is still very similar. You know, you start getting more sort of motifs from Islam, Islamic language, the Quran, things like that. Um, you know, more mention, obviously, of, of the Prophet uh, Muhammad and, and the sort of other tropes. But um, still very much rooted in this desert milieu, even if it's, it's only figurative, and, and using still a lot of um, a lot of rare words. And so, for that reason, I think for modern readers, it is harder to it's harder to approach. Mm. Um, and for that reason, you know, these these figures, I think, need more more of an introduction. I mean, two, two thoughts occur to me while we've been speaking, right? Um, you know, we talk about the the page, patron accounts and like YouTube, right? I was thinking like, what what animations of these poetry, what would they look like? And I don't know if they've been attempted, right? And the other thing, um, oh gosh, what was the other thing that was in my mind? I can't believe it's escaped. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was, um, you know, you're saying that um, these um, Gulf um, foundations are trying to sort of um, 
reintroduce their population to heritage and whatnot. But I think I think part of the problem is when you provincialize certain yeah. um, cultures. Or what I mean by that is that you don't you don't recognize this kind of the, the kind of um, universal kind of human elements, right? That can yeah. that can appeal. Um, so th- those are just two thoughts that came to my mind when talk about um, what, what, while we've been talking. Um, unless you've got more to say on Farazdaq, um, we looked at we looked at then we looked at Abu Nawas, then we looked at Abu Al Atahia, the, the, the very much very contrasting figures, um, because of Abu Nawas the hedonist, and then you have Abu Al Atahia the aesthetic ascetic. Um, and then in five we looked at Abu Tamam, and then I, uh, six we looked at Halaj, who who always stands out for me. Um, and then that was in spring, and then late, then coming nearer to our time, we looked at past there was a Mutanabbi, who you mentioned. Uh, then we looked at Abu Faras al Al Hamadani, who was in prison. Then we look at Ibn Zaydun from Andalusia, then Ibn Arabi, and then we ended with uh, Safi al Din al Hilmi. It was a lot of work we did. I think we should be quite proud of ourselves. Well, you, I, uh, I mean, I give so much credit to you, Talha. I mean, obviously, you know, I. I <laughs> um, Put together the material for these episodes but uh you know you approached me with this idea of, of putting these episodes together um in just the whole idea for a, a series of classical arabic poetry which i think is wonderful um so you know your your vision uh was really what drove this and um yeah i uh you know as you were saying the names you, know, you asked me before what would i you know it's, it's always hard to come up with a process of selection you know, there were so many names that you know we could have included in here uh, with abu tamam i would have loved to have done an episode on al bahtari yeah. who his, his diwan is enormous um and um he's such an important figure uh, even if you just put him together with abu tamam it's kind of his you know quote unquote rival at the time but uh, even even thereafter in terms of his influence on the on the tradition his impact you know he's he's one that i think um you know like al farazdaq deserves more attention deserves more more um you know delving into um yeah i uh why did, why did I put Al Halaj in here? I think, you know, so many of these figures are kind of in the mold of Abu Tamam, Al Mutanabi, and their descendants. Mm. Uh, and I wanted something, you know, uh, Abu, Fir- Abu Firas falls into this category, Ibn Zaydun falls into this category. You know, we talk about classical Arabic poetry, we tend to talk about elite court poets yeah. who write in a certain register and for a certain audience and that is so important to know and understand if you want to get sort of the basis of classical arabic poetry absolutely and then there's this whole undercurrent i don't even call it an undercurrent that's not fair this this parallel uh, you know train track running along the you know the whole of arabic poetry which is figures like al halaj Ibn Arabi, but even they are still writing in sort of this elite classical form. Mm. You know, uh, a Shush study would be a good example of, of someone who wrote, you know, this is uh, a Sufi saint or, you know, Sufi holy figure who who wrote in dialect. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, the whole tradition in, in West Africa of praise poetry to the prophet that, again, is, is not... You know, does not have the same sort of bookish rhetorical flourishes that you get with someone like Abu Tamam or, or even Ibn Arabi. So introducing people to sort of different you know, forms of poetry and not just different forms, but contexts for writing it. Um, you know, I, I mentioned um, I mentioned in the, I think it was the episode on al Halaj, like why I wanted to choose that and how it's, it, that kind of poetry, especially oral poetry, uh, which you know all all poetry is is you know uh, 
uh, at least nominally written to be read out loud. But you can tell that some of the stuff is produced and preserved more orally than, you know, again, more bookish. It's written down and, you know, only on certain occasions would you read it out loud. But um, anyway, that uh, sort of more oral, um, like poetry that by its nature is orally produced and then orally uh, preserved is like jazz and improvising on these sort of different themes or, or lines or things like that and how it changes from uh, occasion to occasion. Yeah, that was really helpful to my thinking in terms of how, how to appreciate what otherwise might come off as sounding very simple and sort of not, um, again, not, not very complex, which if you're reading it on a page, like you want those sort of very, um, you know, almost strained conceits that like El Mutanabi puts together, you know, comparing his, his fever to uh, a tryst with a woman mm. or, um, you know, or saying, you know, I've, I've brought a garden to, uh, on my, on my tongue to, you know, you, the, the patron, the memdur, talking about a qasida, comparing it to a garden. These sort of like, again, very strained, um, you know, far-fetched in a good way, metaphors like that. Uh, you don't get all that kind of rhetorical stuff in Zig and these sort of more oral poetry, but there's a whole other aspect to it. But again, like, you know, the performative aspect in terms of jazz, also the, the theological element to you know, the, their ideas they are embedded in these poems. Anyway, all that's to say that you know, I've tried to choose um, some names outside of this, this norm of, sort of the elite court, courtly poet figure that we tend to stick to. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the choice of Ibn Arabi was, was really inspired. But when I'm looking over this list, I'm thinking, who else could we have chosen? You mentioned al Um I mean, we don't have any female um, poets, I've noticed. And also, yeah. I was thinking we could have done people from, um, people writing in Arabic outside of the um, heartlands, like right in West Africa and, and places like yeah. the Indian subcontinent. That that wouldn't have been really interesting. So I don't know <clears throat> if we came up with them because we we did we did brainstorm who to come up with like coming up with like 12, eleven to twelve people. Um, I don't know whether in hindsight if there's other names that that could have been contenders as well. Yeah, for the uh, another another thing that would have been great too is to spend. I mean, you know, it's it's called the Abbasid History Podcast, so you can only stretch the, the you can only go with the long Abbasid period yeah. only so far, I guess. But you know, the the whole Mamluk period, there's just dozens of names of poets who are all very interesting. The other one that I would have, if you had to choose two major ones to go over, sort of with a smattering of Arabic poetry like this, would be Ibn Nubata and Misri, dies in the 14th century. Um, in fact, Thomas Bauer would probably be upset that I chose Safiya Dean over Ibn Nubata al Masri, who's uh, you know quite a quite a towering figure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I tried to I tried to mention <clears throat> um, the important names among women poets as much as possible, um, and you know I, I hate that. We had only twelve episodes to do. Uh, I would have loved to do an episode on Al Khansa. Right. I would love to give yeah. Walada bint al Mustakfi her own episode too. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, there, there's there even even for poetesses who don't have their own diwans. You know, there's there's all these kind of snippets of of poetry by women preserved in anthologies. Um, you know that you can you can mention. Um, and um, let's see. I mean, all the, all the Abbasid poets too. Um, who did we miss out? Who who else? Who, who else would have? Oh, what's his name? Um, the blind guy. Bashar yeah, Nibor. Bashar Nibor. Yeah. He was exactly who I was thinking of. Just such an interesting character. But you know, partly he has this great poem on, uh, you know, vaunting non-Arab heritage. Uh, sort of so sort of the Shorbia kind of snippet um but then you know a lot of a lot of sort of erotic poetry uh, he he in many ways is kind of you know in the spirit of abu nawas which is why again you know with only 12 episodes to work with if you have to choose one major figure who kind of represents those themes uh you know people are more familiar with abu nawas which brings more listeners but then um you know, 
Rashad in many ways kind of presages what Abu Nawas does uh, and, and is a good pairing with him. He, you know, the three of them, Abu Nawas, Bashar, and Abu Atahi are kind of this trio uh, he could he could very fruitfully talk about together. Uh, and, uh... I mean, so what... The, 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 re- yeah, the, 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 the remit, our remit, okay, is pre-Islamic until uh, just at the... Ottoman takeover, when, whenever that is, um, fifteen seventeen, because it's technically an Abbasid caliph, like in yeah. Cairo. Right? So I stretch it really long, and plus you've got reception history as well, because then you can say what's the reception right. of Al Mutanabbi in the seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century, right? So, right. so that, that that's that, right. That, that would still be um, um, valid. I mean, I'm always I'm always keen, like, to be as like as broad as possible in terms of um geography as well um yeah i mean i chose i just chose the name abbas because you need a, you need somewhere to start right and right. like like for me um i like history to be as as sort of um global as possible and um like what one thing i do i'm thinking of doing so sort of going ahead in the future is like speaking to people who cover regions which are sort of outside of the Islamic case. Like so for example, what's happening in Japan in the twelfth century, what's happening in right. the Americas or in the Australias or Southeast Asia, right? And sort of like see if, if there's anything we could connect up together. Because I don't like doing these sort of like boxes because that's not how people live, right? Like we like right. like we like to think that oh our time is unique in this like how like me I'm talking to you in Utah it's an eight hour difference right but we like to think our time is unique and just like inter- like crisscross across the globe but it's not I mean like it's like it's it's been happening since human beings could walk right so it's just got got faster over time so I'm always keen to like um, make those sort of um, connections and interactions and and whatever. Um, and also to look beyond just Arabic as well. So I would like to like maybe repeat the same exercise using Persian, maybe, or even Kurdish, yeah. or, or any other language. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really, I really appreciate what you say about geographical diversity. This is something that I, um, you know, I, I do my best to um, address if I'm, you know, if I'm writing a paper or giving a presentation or you know with these episodes. Um, just to give the sense of the breadth in, you know, for how many centuries Arabic was the language of, you know, a political empire, but then also this, you know, such an important world religion and culture and all these things anyway. Um, and yeah, and, and, and like you said, you could, you could repeat that with, with Persian, with Ottoman Turkish, um, with Urdu, um, and, you know, in, in Hebrew, insofar as we consider that a, uh, which I would, you know, part of Islamic civilization, um, you know, it's just... Too much to do. <laughs> I mean, because why find it like? Oh, by the way, I, I, it'd be nice to hear from. Oh, just Laurie's disappeared. Just when I was going to invite her on, oh, that's sad. Okay, I'm sure she's, oh. she's got. I'm sure she's got other things to do. Um, so, um, because I was thinking. Um, oh gosh, what was I about to say? Um, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? I hate when this happens. Your mind slips, and, and there's other people in front of you. Um, oh gosh, what was I about to say? I saw Laura, I was going to bring on Laurie and she just, oh, this was what I was going to say. Um, if we was going to go beyond poetry and just look, look at literature more general, I did want to, I do, I, I do want to look at, um, Ibn Mukaffa and Khalilah. Yeah. Abdullah, right. But check this out. This is something I believe in strongly, right? Um, I see Ibn Mukaffa as a proto Machiavellian figure, right? And yeah. like you know, like the like you know, Robert, you know, you know who Robert Greene is, right? Yes. Forty eight strategies of war and whatnot, right? So, yes. for me, even Kafa are like preceded all of that, or he can be a source of all of that, right? And yeah. um, I would love to see someone sort of like working with Khalil and Dimna and make like one of these like Robert Greene style um, productions, sort of like you know. 10 rules of whatever getting ahead in life you know and it would work oh 
Oh yeah. I, you know, it's such an interesting, um, such an interesting question. So are, are you familiar with, uh, the, it's an ERC funded project called Anonym Classic. This is Beatrice Grindler's big, uh, big project at, uh, it's based at FU Berlin. No, no, hello. So, yeah. So, so Anonym Classic is just, you know, the first part of anonymous minus the OUS at the end and then classic, and it's all mushed together in one word. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a massive project to sort of trace uh, all the manuscripts that we have in, you know, primarily Islamicate languages. Um, they have partners, apparently, who are working on other traditions, but it's, it's Kalila and Dimna focused, you know. Um, so we're uh, recovering, transcribing, uh, hyperlinking all of these, these texts and then analyzing them. Um, it's been going on for, for years, and I'm, I'm sure it will continue to go on. Anyway, that's you know one of a couple of things that I can think of, and also I should mention, um, you know, Library of Arabic Literature has a um, a, a translation of Kalila and Dimna out. I think it's I think it's supposed to be out in January. I think they had to delay the, the date by a little bit. But anyway, it's um, translated by team translated by Michael Fishbane and um, James Montgomery. Anyway, um, in the introduction. You know, they they address this question of is Kalila and Dimna, is Ibn al Muqaffa a proto Machiavelli? Um, and I think you can make a case for it. Um, I'm actually looking right now at uh, at what they say. Basically, the 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 point that they make is, you know, we shouldn't. Um, you know, you, you can you can read it that way, but then it's. Uh, you shouldn't overstate the point. So they say, um, let's see, they, they quote a, uh, a Sanskritist named Franklin Edgerton who tried to reconstruct, who did reconstruct the, um, you know, as best we know, sort of you know, what we have from the original Sanskrit. Um, and quoting him, they said, most of the stories remain true to the keynote of the book, its Machiavellian character. They're generally unmoral and at times positively immoral in the political lessons they inculcate or at least like you know not quoting anymore at least it's you know impression you come away with is it's like well that it's not always it's not always right to do the right thing sometimes you have to do the the unsavory thing but that will preserve the nation or or your friendship or yourself right. or whatever right. um but you know the 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 editors or the, the translators go on to say uh, you know, some of the stories, they celebrate successful friendships, overcoming difficulties. Um, and all of this is supposed to, I guess, often portray that this world is unstable in contrast with, you know, the permanence of the reward that God promises to the righteous. Anyway, um, that's, that's kind of where, and that's sort of how I think about this now, you know, having read it, the, the text and, and thought about this particular point because it's it's I absolutely agree you know that you could read a lot of points made you know or, or morals from these stories as proto Machiavellian at the same time you know virtue often does win out um, so I don't know it's um, yeah, I think it could go either way the, the point I was going to make which which escaped my mind temporarily was this so oh sorry <laughs> sorry I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 you, did, you, did, you didn't cut me off. No, no, no. I, the, I, before I asked about Kalina and Dimna, there was something else that was on my mind. And now it's come back. It's the thing about, we're talking about sort of um, language being sort of uh, across um, regions. So obviously Arabic is, you know, spoken by people because of, of, of Islam, sort of beyond sort of Arabic regions, right? Because I think in the Persianate, the Persianate always has that sort of, cosmopolitan international quality to it. So there's been some recent works on like Persian in India, right? And yeah. I'm not seeing any works regarding Arabic language um, literature as well as sort of scholarship in general, uh, let's say in India or in West Africa, uh, unless, you, unless you can think of something, because nothing comes to my mind. Yeah, I think it's rare. I think it's rare. Um, I think there's also it, so on on that point. Um, you know, my PhD advisor Tahir Qutbuddin has a an article that she wrote a little while ago on Arabic in India, and also has a you know section in there on Persian in India. 
Um, and I, you know, I've seen more like uh, Oludamine Ogunike's um, work on West African poetry, but you know, these are these are I think exceptions to the rule, which is you know, the, for a generation, if not more, you know, people have been focused on. Uh, you know, Golden Age Baghdad, for example, yeah. or the Mu'allaqat and things that help us understand the Mu'allaqat, things like that. You know, there's sort of this inertia, the center of gravity. And I absolutely agree, you know, it's important to move to move past that. Um, and this has to do, I think, a lot with departmental silos. People who study, you know, people who are, are Ottomanists tend not to study Arabic poetry of the Ottoman period. Mm. They tend to you know, be historians or scholars of Islamic thought primarily, as in, you know, all of our fields, or if they're going to, you know, focus on literature, they focus on literature written in, in Ottoman Turkish. And, you know, again, that's understandable, but there's plenty of Arabic poetry written under the Ottoman, um, in the Ottoman Empire as well. So, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. There's also this tendency, I think, more with Persian to sort of integrate it into, um, kind of a comparative literature perspective so more work you know comparing the the Shahnameh to other national epics for example um or you know more work looking at persian mystical poetry within the context of like comparative mystical poetry i think um again for sort of historical and disciplinary reasons you know arabic literature has not had that kind of attention paid to it again in a sort of comparative literary perspective for some of the same reasons as uh, you know we were just talking about in terms of geographical focus also arabic is really hard and it's hard to you know hold it in your head so i can understand why someone would solely focus on you know i need to get better at understanding what's written in arabic uh and if that would lead them away from you know reading classics from other other work uh, from other other traditions and therefore not you give them as much a chance to to make truthful comparisons anyway all that's just you know thoughts about a good point you made um look the, the great raymond harvey's with us I, we, we can't let him go until we hear from him um, <laughs> it's good 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 he's joined us on a bank holiday monday evening um before that Let's see what Sophia has to say. I've, I've given her the mic, so she just needs to unmute herself if she wants to say anything. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the mic. Um, no, listening, first of all, thank you for the podcast. And listening to the conversation, I just wanted to contribute from the point of view of the audience. Because, um, and this is personal experience, but I guess it would reflect on other uh, listeners as well. To some of us, I mean, you're the experts about the poets and the literature, but to some of us, uh, the, the incentive is, is different, or we are being drawn into um, this um, aspect of Arabic literature through religion. So one of the things is that um, it's, it's eye-opening and it is a great um, source for us to discover things other than the Quran, like what it was mentioned earlier. Um, and the other thing that I personally liked very much uh, was the fact that um, uh, Dr. Blankenship uh, was contextualizing uh, the poets and their work and their life. So it's it's history and, and literature together. And in some aspects, especially in the episode about Ibn um, Zaydun and Walada, that I would like to hear more about her, um, it was also... Uh, actions and behaviors and even words within the poems that they um, they shocked me in the sense that we generally today have this um, romanticized idea about um, the past Muslims or the past um, Islamic societies or Muslim societies. So in this epi episode, it was quite shocking uh, to listen to the poems and their lifestyles and, and the actions. Uh, and it, it kind of brings the reality into the forefront that, uh, you know, the, the ideal that we have in our mind might not be what life actually was back then. So, yes, thank you very much. The, the contribution that you make is, is, is much beyond the strictly 
poetic or, or you know, literature um, topic. That's all. Thank you, Sophia, for your contribution and thank you for your uh, support. Do you want to say anything, Dr. Blankenship? Yeah, if I could, if I could respond to that. First of all, thank you. This is a very, very thoughtful remarks, and uh, thank you for for listening and engaging with uh, with our, our podcast episodes. I, you know, I, I, I myself am a, a person of faith. I'm Christian, and so I um, I'm aware of sort of this trying to balance between sort of two, I'll call them constituencies or, you know, audiences or readerships for lack of a, lack of a better word. On the one hand, you know, a lot of uh, people I engage with professionally are scholars and academics who, um, you know, I won't say most of them, but many of them are secular people who have sort of a, a tense relationship with religion. And on the other hand, so many people who, um, you know, have, have, have said they they appreciate you know the, the kind of work that Talha has been doing and the, the opportunity I had to, to talk a little about Arabic poetry are are Muslims um you know from wherever they hail from all over the world and it's interesting because as you said Sophia uh, you coming coming at these texts from the point of view of from from a religious point of view as a person of faith um. You know, I, I'm sure if it's the first time that you've heard Abu Nawas, uh, you know, make fun of Ramadan uh, or talk about how bad it is <laughs> to, to fast during Ramadan. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, or, or, or other things like this, you know, it's uh, it, it can be shocking. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with one of my Arabic teachers. Uh, her name is Nagwa Saba. She's a professor at Alexandria University, I believe. In, uh, in Egypt. And I asked her, you know, we read some Abu Nawas in, in a class I took with her, and I asked her about what practicing Muslims, you know, think about this. And her response was, and I think this, you know, reflects partly her, um, you know, her education in the humanities and in literature. She said, you know, this is part of our culture and part of our heritage. Even though, you know, I can disagree with the kind of lifestyle Abu Nawas lived, the kind of things that he said, you know, he still has many lines of poetry that are beautiful uh, and and that speak to the beauty of the language um, and, and how it can be used. I, you know, in that episode in particular, I, I brought up how, you know, Secular people might take someone like Abu Nawas to be this proto LGBTQ uh, rights figure, someone who, you know, was willing to openly say, you know, I I am attracted to men and to women. Um, you know, I, I drink wine, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, uh, even though I'm I'm nominally a Muslim. So, you know, how do you square that with? Um, you know, this is part of our heritage, but this is something that we disagree with too. And I think you know, the value of studying anything from the past, whether it's literature or philosophy or, or religion, is to to put your own, you know, faith, your own perspective, in, you know, into broader vision of of what it means to be a Muslim, um, and you know, and to take away from someone like Abu Nawas what you can, because you know, clearly he's very deeply engaged with the Muslim tradition, you know, um, he, he, clearly he knew a lot about it, even if it, at the end of the day, he, he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't on board with everything that, that Islam teaches. And I think, you know, it's, it's less about Abu Nawas was a, you know, a, a disbeliever or someone who actively fought against Islam as it is that he was irreverent. And we've all known irreverent people within our own faith traditions. Anyway, uh, this is all just to, to thank you for that particular point. And, and again, to express my awareness that, you know, I, I engage with, and I think we all engage with people who their opinion of, of religion, of, um, you know, of society, of all these things that we're talking about, they're, they're, it, it's as varied as the people themselves. Um, um, before I get... Um... Nasser on uh, and I look through his Twitter account and um, he uh, seems to be working publishing so it'd be, it'd be good to have him Raymond yeah. Harvey DM'd me because I, 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 and he said he's not in a position to speak um, and it's not his expertise but um, I, I had wanted to speak to him for a long time about um, philosophy stuff so I just thought I'd communicate that to him and his sort of Husserlian 
turn as a as an antidote to the Kantian and I, I don't know how much thought he's given to like the Akbarian as antidote to the Kantian but anyway while he's here that's what I just wanted to share with him I, I don't claim to be an expert in all of that but there's something that's been on my mind it's like something we can talk if we ever meet in real life so uh, Nasser feel free to unmute yourself if you want to um, say something Thank you for the opportunity. Um, um, you're, uh, you were cutting off, so I, did, I couldn't hear like uh, much of what you said. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it's more about what uh, I, I found. I. Uh, um, uh, like um, uh, this topic is too interesting, although um, it's um, it, to me it's all about translation. And when I look at translation, um, I think there is a big problem um, between the East and the West, the Arab and the, uh, like um, and the West regarding to this matter, because uh, when we uh, look back at um, like uh, the Middle Age or the, uh, that time where, um, uh, if you know, um, and I think Dr. Uh, Kiffin know about um, what they call it, Madrasa Tulaytila, or Tulaytila School, uh, for uh, translators, uh, which is uh, considered one of the oldest uh, school in translation, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, translated most of the Arab and Hebrew books into uh, uh, Latin and uh, the, you know, um, English uh, language and uh, translate all the um uh, uh, into English and after that somehow the West tried to play this so uh, like uh, uh, superiority on the like uh, on the on the uh, upon the east and neglect the Arab especially, and neglect the Arab culture, neglect whatever, novels, poetry, uh, whatever being written, it's not there. Uh, when we look today to the uh, translations like uh, uh, into English language from uh, the Spanish, uh, Spanish, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, Hindu, whatever language you will, we will see, uh, the Arabic is far behind all these la languages uh, uh, and uh, into the translation market and in, in the West. Um, I read a study. Uh, which followed 30 years from 1990, I think, till something like 2016-17. And the average of uh, Arabic book translated from Arabic to English was around 15 wow. book per year. Uh, which is like, I don't know, is a... Uh, is that because uh, I don't have now that, that the English reader is not interested, or is it because of the media? Is it because of whatsoever? Uh, so, talking just about the classical Arabic, it's not just the classical Arabic, it's any Arabic. Uh, it's not welcomed uh, by. Uh, publishers by um, I don't know organizations, uh, cultural organization who support uh, whatever like you know events. So um, it's it's not there. 
it's not there. So it's not just a classical Arabic where I want to say, and um, um, I cannot uh, go like deep into finding the root behind uh, uh, this uh, uh, Kant uh, situation, but this is this is how it is, and. Um, well, this is one of the reasons that I've started uh, Dar Arab, which is uh, Dar Arab Dar is like publishing house. Uh, so uh, Arab publishing house in uh, in the UK. Um, and, and I'm not advertising it. Um, I think I remember I uh, text uh, uh, Dr. Kevin, um, like I sent him a private message, uh, but I think he was busy. Anyhow, this is my comment. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you for your contribution, Nasser. Um, I actually would be interested to, to know about your um, um, project with Dar Arab and to know about sort of your background and, and, and great experience. So if, if you're interested in sharing that with us, I mean, feel free to tell us. I, I don't know whether, Dr. Blankenship, whether you have anything to, to say in response. Yeah, just to briefly respond. First of all, I, I apologize. I do remember your you you sending your message, Nasser. Um, it, it just yeah, I I, <laughs> I I wasn't able to to respond in a timely fashion. But I am I am very happy to be in touch with you, and 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 we'll write you back. Uh, on the point about translation, I think in the West, the um you know there is this historical problem with Arabic and Islam. In the Middle East, uh, you know, I'm reminded of something that apparently a, a publisher told Edward Said when he was trying to either translate something or publish something, which is that Arabic is a dangerous language. Uh, you know, that's the imp old impression, I think. Now, I don't think people have that impression anymore. And again, especially with modern Arabic literature and contemporary Arabic literature, people are more interested. One problem I see is that, well, it's a, it's a problem, but also an opportunity maybe, uh, is that a lot of interest in modern Arabic writing or you know contemporary Arabic writing now has to do with social issues. So if we're going to translate or publish a book in translation from Arabic, it has to show something about the problem of women in the Middle East or, you know, um, extremism or terrorism or poverty or something like that. And obviously, those are all very important pressing issues and we should be talking about them. At the same time, literature is so much more than that. Uh, I, you know, I, I was reading uh, Celestial Bodies by Joha Al-Harthi, which of, of course won, you know, for, for, the, for the translation in the book itself, won the international... Um, the, the Man Booker International Prize. And the translator, Marilyn Booth, who's a, a professor at Oxford, she said, you know, it's important not to read Arabic literature solely or maybe even primarily as a lens on <clears throat> Arab society. Because novels especially, and she was talking about a novel, use imagination. They play with time. Time is not linear in novels, not all the time anyway, <clears throat> novels use language in a certain way, they use metaphor, they use images, and these go beyond sort of mere reality. And I think um, this is something that, you know, for as much attention as is now being, uh, publishers are now paying to modern Arabic literature, it still tends to, which is all good, it still tends to be about things that can teach us something about the social issues of the Middle East. And I think for for Arabic and really any Middle Eastern literature tradition to get the, the, the praise it deserves and the attention it deserves, we need to even go beyond that to where <clears throat> literary merit itself is enough for a novel or a poem or something to be translated. But I, and also, I really appreciate your, your comments. They're very thoughtful, so thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Kevin, but uh, if uh, uh, the host allow me just to comment uh, on what you said, uh, uh, art uh, is not Al Jazeera, is not Al Arabiya, is not, uh, you know, CNN, uh, it's not about just issues, uh, art and literary is about literary, 
And if we want Arabs only, if we welcome Arabs like, uh, you know, uh, novels and poems, if it's only about, well, look, if you call up, if you, if it's about sex, if it's about sexual, if it's about women, yeah, it's welcome. But if it's, if it's something different, no, it's not welcome. It's not like that. Uh, I, I hate this actually because I have seen like big, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, big publishing house asking the same from the writers bring me like you know uh this this kind of topics with which is uh, they, they they want to just replicate or simulate what if going in the media uh it, it, it's not that we, we like you cannot go to an english writer for example and ask him you know write me about this and this will go on the market uh and uh, you cannot do that, but on, 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 when we go to Arabs, but, you know, if you want your book to be translated, you have to write on these certain topics. This is, what is this? I don't know. This is, this is not innovation. This is not art. This is not literary. This is just topics. This is media. This is what, what's being built for years and years in the Western minds. And they just want to to know about this mystery world, like, uh, and tell us about it, which is, um, uh, I, I disagree. Although, on uh, like on market side, it does work perfectly. I do agree. Thank you, Nasser. I mean, I. You know, when we were talking earlier, uh, Dr. Blankenship, about provincialization of experiences and kind of how um, other things are sort of universalized, right? Like, I think of like something like the art of war, right? That, that sort of beyond its time, it's sort of read, still read today, sort of, you know, across the world, right? Or something like Marcus Aurelius, right? It's read still read today across the world right and um i think i think there's something not right when you have to sort of prove your humanity to other people to sort of take you seriously um and i think also um the nature of art and literature is that it's part of a sort of dire chronic conversation with those who have passed away and those who have yet to be born and so I, I, I don't think people, I don't think pe people should, um, I think people should feel aware of the, who their audience are. If they're not going to receive an audience in their lifetime, then, you know, they can at least hope for an audience after they're dead. Um, and because any honest sort of research in the future will, ha will have to consider your work as, sort of, as part of like an honest appraisal of, 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 of the time. Um, the other thing I was thinking is like, Upon, who, upon whom is the burden of, of, of uh, producing these works and publishing them? Because surely, it sh it, 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 why are we looking to publishers in America and Europe to translate and publish Arabic language or any foreign language work? Why aren't like why aren't there people sort of in the Arabic speaking world sort of looking for translators? Why aren't they publishing it? Why aren't they promoting it? So. You know, there's that. So those are just some of my thoughts in response to it. I appreciate your contributions, Nelson. Dr. Blankenship. Well, I, you know, I, I really don't have uh, too much to add. Um, in fact, I was just going to suggest, you know, we can take another question if some or a comment if someone wants to ask a question or make a comment. But yeah, I just agree with everything that you said. Um, you know, the, being a specialist in pre-modern Arabic especially I've just seen how rich the tradition is and how much there is there and the same is true of modern Arabic literature and contemporary Arabic literature and um, I don't know uh, we also we live in a time when people are very you know understandably focused on certain social justice issues and that this is driving a lot of the market not just in you know Middle Eastern literatures but uh, I think literature in general and just the the overall public conversation in general 
Um, so it, you know, it's understandable, but not necessarily an excuse that uh, people would want to focus in on on those topics. Okay, I mean, it's getting it's nine thirty here now in the evening. Um, I don't if if there's anyone else who wants to um, express their thoughts, um, feel free to um, to send me a request. Um, I've spoken a lot. I think there's 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 so much to take away, and to think about, um, and I thank everyone for joining us, and especially those who have been here since the beginning as well. That's really quite impressive. Uh, we we have been recording this, so I'm gonna try and edit this and uh, get this out as well. So anyone who wasn't here could hear it. Um, I think what we might try and do is sort of uh, wind down and start wrapping up. Um, are there any sort of final thoughts that you, you want to share with us, Dr. Blankenship? No, I was just going to add my own um, expression of thanks to everyone for your comments, for your questions, for participating, and, and even if you were just listening, uh, it's been a wonderful connect. And I, you know, hopefully we can we can stay in touch whether on Twitter uh, or email or, or any other way that, that, that you want to stay in touch. I'm always, always interested to, um, to exchange ideas with thoughtful people, so thank you. This was originally going to be done on YouTube, and if anyone wants to express their thoughts on this, I would appreciate this, right, because it's something me and Dr. Blankenship have talked about quite a lot about um, social media, and, like, you know, I don't, I don't want to be... I don't like it, right, and I don't like being complicit with it, but it's almost inescapable. And I have been thinking a lot about shifting this podcast to YouTube, but I'm very conscious that there's a downward decline in people's dignity quite quickly on that forum. And I was thinking about ways to mitigate that. And what, one of the ways I was thinking is um, to make it as formal as possible, right? Like I, I was thinking of like literally wearing a shirt and tie and uh, not to do anything live to always edit it. And... Um, uh, to, to try not focus upon the, the two people, to try and sort of have like extracts from books or other images, like as 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 the focus rather than the two people. So if anyone has any good thoughts on that, I, I really would would, would uh, welcome them. Whether we should start shifting to YouTube and how to mitigate the inherent dig indignities that accompany that. Um, the other thing um, I was thinking about was whether to also. Uh, start a Patreon as well again there's something quite grubby and sort of quality of a grifter about that but if anyone's got any thoughts on that that would be um, uh, really cool I mean you, you, you can either say it now or you can sort of you know if it's getting too late for you for wherever you are then um, feel free to uh, message me um, I think everyone's getting tired now um, I, I really appreciate Dr Blankenship joining us all the way in Utah um, and I appreciate for everyone who's joined us and anyone joined us late. I'm going to try and edit this and, and get this um, up on our uh, normal podcast forum. So with that, I thank you all. Anyone here in the UK, um, I wish them a good night. And if you're wherever you are, I wish you a, a good morning or a, or a good afternoon. Thanks again, everyone. Hope to stay in touch. And thank you, Talha, for all of your hard work. I really appreciate it this chance to talk to everyone. Thank you everyone for your contributions and uh, we hope to meet up soon. Take care. Bye-bye.